Dr. Head Stuffing held the winking scalpel aloft with the delicacy and firmness of a man who knows his job. The shaking had stopped, and from the liver bared before the blade to his noble mind pulsed a ligament of concentration. He took a quick breath and made a deep lateral incision, skidding through the resentful tissue, slicing the kidneys, scoring the bacon and puncturing the fried egg. Unabashed, he watched the yolk pus swell and seep over the sunny side to skate onto the oily blue willow plate. Swab, he barked. Dulcie head stuffing passed the toast. Munching with surgeon precision, with a forefinger like a bludgeon, he indicated the invitation card, silver-edged and printed in haughty copper plate, which snarled at him from the table. You are asked, it read, to an eating at Rawlinson End, 9 p.m. sharp, RSVP. RSVP? queried Dulcie Headstuffing. And shall you reponde, if you please? I do not please, sighed the doctor and the abbreviated letters stand for Rawlinson shall violently punish. He looked mournfully at his wife. You don't have to attend, my dear. They only want me there to man the stomach pump, and I know how much that sickens you. He pecked her an antiseptic kiss on the cheek. Tired as he was, his suit was still clean-cut as cheese slices, and the morning surgery had been unusually heavy, at least fifty villagers suffering from Sir Henry's blemish. It was the custom, since old Sir Hilary Rawlinson's cheerful time, to reward the serfs with a Christmas florin. There was an arrow slit in the back wall of the great house, through which the happy peasants traditionally thrust their hands to receive the kindness. This benevolence was in no way assumed by kindly Sir Henry, but with one novelty. He ordered the coins made red hot in the stove. This made the bounty less fun to receive, and it was ruffian Dick Gruffly who hit on the idea of wearing mittens. Immediately, Henry imposed a glove tax of two and threepence, reasoning, on the one hand, a small profit, and in the other, at least some screaming to brighten the season of good cheer. But all too soon the mark became the stigmata of heroes. And at Christmas, to wear a hand free of Sir Henry's blemish showed a weak heart, notwithstanding some business sense, for Dr. Headstuffing charged a tosser room for his soothing salve. So it set you back a tanner to display daring. At Rawlinson End, much of a postcard Christmas, it wasn't. No jolly coach loads, horses grinning at the bit, no crack of whips and heavy-coated Robin Goodfellows bringing the British sherry over the ice. Above a charcoal stick scape of wish-wash and rain hues, clouds like a cough hawked, threatening big spits and awful gobbing and any amount of unseasonal nasty. And this sky had teeth. But preparations for the eating were well underway. In the grounds, deep Trenches were dug, with poles slung across, and a choice of news or sandpaper. And logs were hewn for the great bonfire by the lake. In the house, commodes, poles, potties, and discreet piles of sawdust were dumped at strategic places in deference to the vast excretion and deluge of waste product to come. All this clanking, chopping and whistling made something of a dent in Sir Henry's slumber edition of Africa. An insect wire whine, both horizontal and insistent in the nigritude of cranial self, bone cavern of limitless egos, ears resisting epaulettes on the id, but noisy, crashing intelligences found sphincter exit like cracked worms. Yink, yink, yink. Mind you, I spared the poor beast from the endangered species list. <laughs> I shot them. They're extinct. For Sir Henry, waking up was 
not a welcome way of beginning the day. Camped in the shadow of those old fierce gods, campfires seem to make them dance. <laughs> Henry yawned like a woman stretching, bleary eye on tiptoe to Tadanus. And then the golden stool of the Ashanti had to run for it. <laughs> Mrs. E appeared in the doorway. What? What? Breakfast, dear, sniffled the housekeeper. Fried or fried? Bring me meat burned like St. Joan and vicious mustards to pierce the tongue like cardigan's lances, roared Henry. May God make you fart! Get out! <laughs> In the green, dismaying shadows, dark-furred night crouched like a jungle at the edge of uncivilization, then sprang and tore at the stone flesh of Rawlinson End. This night, the company traditionally included a poor stranger sore buffeted by life. And this year, the lucky devil was the sore buffeted Ben Quake Buttock, the blind poacher, his crimes all forgotten on this day of rejoice. Somewhere in the house, Ben, the whole top half of his head obscured with a fancy knotted rag, was very drunk and lost. Hello? Hello? I'm very excited. Hello? The dinner table boasted daffodils on green linen with artistically arranged clods of soil. The napery was shaped like a fig leaf, and beside each rainbow-coloured plate was a potato shaped like a penis with a candle stuck in the end. Great Aunt Florrie glided to her place at the foot of the table. In the quivering, fidgety orange of the candlelight, she looked very beautiful. She stared at her rearing potato. Well, what do you think, Mr. Slodden? But the Reverend Mr. Slodden, clergyman defrocked, exorcist and ex-Broadmoor, was transfixed, staring at Henry's younger brother, Hubert, who was plinking a ukulele and... Buzzing. Mr. Slotten sneezed. See. Mrs. E. poured him another glass of port. Do you suffer with stubborn stains, dear? I, 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 I keep myself as an empty vessel for God to fill as he will. I know, I, I know a lovely hymn. I learned it on my missionary travels. I was telling the story of the crucifixion to a party of Mongolian bandits and... Gulping his drink, Mr. Slodden, his false legs squeaking, hobbled himself to the harmonium and fumbled a few uplifting chords. They loved this one, uh, the bandits, he burbled. As he pumped the pedals, his cassock rode up to reveal that his grey sock on the wooden leg was attached with drawing pins. Hubert made up the words. He's walking on the water, spreading his light. He raises up a dead man, makes him feel all right. I can see him coming. Spreading his light, spreading his light all around. When your ship is sinking, he's the bung in your pump. When you can't find your keyhole, hooray for Holman Hunt. He even works at weekends, he's never out to lunch. He is spreading his light all around. In a nighty made of poplin, spreading his light, the shepherd plays Scott Joplin all through the night, squeezing on his organ, spreading his light, and clinging to his old rugged cross. Get that good man's haircut, 
The first course was, of course, soup, served in china beakers. It was called spring consomme, a cold, greenish soup with live tadpoles swimming in it. And everybody had to wear blindfolds. It was fun to let them wriggle on your tongue before swallowing them. I've got a lively fellow in me. <laughs> mm. It was fun, too, that old Scrotum traditionally popped a great diving beetle or some such into at least one of the beakers to lively things up a bite. Then came the main course, and I must say that with a garnish of wild flowers strewn on the steaming top of it, the meadow potpourri looked rather delish. It was fun, too, to guess what you were eating. Whoa, oh, big god. Parts of these ferrets are crunchy. <laughs> what, what, what's up with you, old man? Not eating? Not a ruddy vegetable area, are you? Mr. Slodden looked positively saintly, like a condemned man taking his last naked bath under the beady scrutiny of warders, saying farewell to his precious body, scrubbing the sins of the world from his innocent, obedient flesh. I, I am thinking of becoming a vegan, he murmured. Well, you've certainly got a vegan expression on your face. <laughs> Pass the hot African sauce. You, you, you'll um, have some salad then, said Henry, lolling as gracious as Nero. Reverend Mr. Slodden eyed a perfectly innocuous bowl of greens and nodded eagerly. Hope you like garlic, breathed Henry, with a breath that would make pine stripping a thing of the past. And a little dressing, of course. He snapped his fingers at Scrotum, who pulled the cork out of a nauseous-looking bottle of dark rum. Pour it on, Macduff! <laughs> no need to toss a Rawlins salad, chortled Henry. And he was right, for in seconds the salad began to heave violently and to Reverend Slodden's horror, dozens of large caterpillars made their maddened escape from the lettuce, throwing themselves onto the table and hooping off in all directions. Some of them were screaming, Help me! Help me! Reverend Slodden fainted and slumped into his curry. Damned alcoholics! They can't hold their drink, you know, they just drink it. Henry unpocketed a large tin of Wrigley's patent foot powder from his waistcoat and snuffed a great pinch of it. <laughs> Just hope he doesn't burst into flame. All of them do that, you know, alcoholics. Spontaneous combinations, they call it, Master, grinned old Scrotum. Poor Mr. Slodden, but we'd put him out, wouldn't we? said Flory. Ah, we would too, Mum," said Scrotum happily, fingering his expectant trousers. Mm -hmm. 